I wrote this book because I really needed this book. Uh, I have now two daughters, and we're only 10 years into this mobile device era, surprisingly enough, and there's a dearth of really good guidelines about it. I don't find that there's a lot of um, wisdom from, you know, the older generation. They have trouble, you know, directly applying what they've gone through to the situation we have here. And I also found a really big disconnect between the discourse in schools around technology and what it was bringing um, versus what I was hearing as a parent. So in schools, I've been covering for a decade now how great it's going to be when technology comes and transforms learning and makes everything so personalized and creative and we'll all be doing robotics and Khan Academy and it's, you know, it's going to be so great and we should buy every child a device. Um, and then at home, it's like this constant drumbeat of concern and worry and, and fear and possibly shame and guilt around the devices and how we are or aren't using them um, correctly. And so I needed a way to try to reconcile that and figure out what does the research say, where is the research showing gaps, where do we need to really fill in ourselves. And I've come to kind of believe that there, we're at an inflection point. You know, whenever a new technology comes or a new, um, you know, kind of way of living comes into people's lives, we're kind of naive to it in the beginning. And there's usually a rush, a stampede to kind of um, uh, assimilate it into our lives. So, like uh, when the Lumiere brothers, you know, showed the video, there was a you know, early film of a train pulling into a station in Paris, and the legend is in 1895 that people screamed and dove and ducked out of the way because they they couldn't believe that it was just a representation on a screen, um, and that actually is not true, it's a famous myth <laughs> about perceptions about media, um, which I find to be totally fascinating in itself, but it is an idea about what happens to our brains when we develop these new forms of representation and how we can try to assimilate them and how we can build up a culture around them. Um, and that's kind of what we're, we're in the process of doing right now, and I think it's, uh, it's gonna demand a lot of our attention um, in the years going forward. Uh, so, Let's talk about kids. Um, there's uh, a couple of different, um, you know, ways of looking at right how uh, kids should be using technology and how they're using it today. Um, but one lens that is very primary right now is the lens of time. So, um, if we can reflect to note that, you know, we've been in a television era for many generations, and um, but children didn't engage as much with television in, in earlier years. So the average age that a child in the 1970s engaged with screen media was beginning around age four, that they really started to get interested in it, and that's when a child can kind of transfer information from the screen without too much trouble, and they get involved in characters and stories and, and that kind of thing, kind of more like a grown-up um, might do it. But the average age that a child today engages with screen media, does anyone have a guess? Excellent. Four months. Um, <laughs> and that would, I mean, and that's, so that's an average, that's from Dimitri Christakis. He's the head of the, one of the heads of the American Academy of Pediatrics, and, and it's based on some of his studies. But honestly, the babies that I know, in video chat is coming in like to delivery rooms. Like that's, that's what I'm seeing. And I'm seeing babies, because the screen is small and because it gets very close to them, that they are having an interaction with videos um, you know, at a very, very, very young age. Um, so that's a time thing. It's starting very early. And the other time dimension that we worry about so much, of course, is time per day or time per week. Um, and that's a big debate because there's actually not the best numbers um, that you would hope to have about the amount of time. And there's a huge dispute about how to measure it in and of itself. So children um, children under one or under two, um, parents are reporting about just under an hour a day with screens on average. Um, children zero to eight, parents are reporting about two hours, 20 minutes a day. And that's pretty steady. It actually hasn't changed all that much since the 1980s. It shifted a ton towards mobile devices. But two hours, 20 minutes for young children. There's an interesting, there's a bell curve. So right before kids enter school at that four, eight, four years old, um, the average in one big study was four hours a day. 
Um, and if that's mind-blowing to you, I mean, you just have to stop and think for a second. Like, we still don't have universal preschool. There's a lot of kids in home-based care. In those home-based cares, the, the, the television is likely to be on a lot of the time. And 42% of American households say that they have the television on all or almost all of the time, whether anyone's watching or not. Um, and that's a huge dilemma, right? Because we don't know how to count that. And do, when parents are asked, answering questions about their kids' media use, are they counting the television that's on in the background? Are they not counting it? That's kind of already a huge, it's already a huge gray area. We haven't even gotten to, you know, 11-year-olds who get their first mobile device, right? And the kids from the tween through the teens, now it gets really complicated. Common Sense Media does this thing. They call it a census, but it's not a census. It's a survey. And it's a national survey, but it's just a survey. And they count, they'll tell you like seven hours a day, eight hours a day, nine hours a day for, teenage, for older teenagers. But they're double counting. They're counting when the kids are doing IMing and their homework and listening to music. They count it three times. So it's a little bit misleading. Um, at the same time, it's unclear whether they count the background TV. Uh, which still may be happening. So you might, you know, if a kid's watching TV, if the TV's on, and then they're also on their phones, we don't know what that is. We know it's super distracting, though. It's very, very distracting. So time per day already, you think it would be really simple, but it's actually super contested. Um, so leaving that aside for a second, in the media effects literature, what are the big concerns that people have, and what have they investigated of the interaction between children and media? Um, the biggest one in the research, the one that really struck me the most, because it is well-founded, it is in, you know, there's a lot of research behind it, and they also understand the mechanism really, really well, is sleep. So when children and adults have devices with light shining in their faces and close to their eyes, more so than television, with the small handheld devices, it causes them to be feel less sleepy, to go to bed later, to wake up earlier, to sleep more shallowly. And this impact on sleep has all these downstream effects. And so that's why I feel like the sleep researchers are like screaming in a padded cell because no one's listening to them and we're talking about all these exotic effects from screen time. But it's so obvious, right? A kid who doesn't get a lot of sleep has trouble consolidating memories. It hurts their learning. It hurts their cognitive development. It hurts their mood. It makes them have a shorter temper. It makes them ha be less, e less able to tolerate frustration. And the effects compound from year to year to year. It kind of becomes, um, you know, that kid the next day, again, they're, they're tired, so their body releases more cortisol, more stress hormone, and they're even more jumpy, and maybe the parent gives them even more screen time, and it gets into a cycle that way. Um, and so it's just, it's kind of massively overlooked, the, the screen. I mean, we used to, people are starting to talk about it, but there's still a lot of devices in bedrooms. There's still television in kids' bedrooms, and the mobile device obviously can go into the bedroom anytime. Um, and so that was one that made a big impression on me and changed my habits at home. Um, the second big area where they have decades of research is in the interaction between kids' weight and also adults' weight and the amount of screen time they have. And this is mostly from decades of research on TV because that's most of what, most of what we have. Um, when a child watches more than two hours a day of television, their risk of obesity doubles. Um, and so it's a pretty significant effect. And it may interact with the sleep issue as well, like I just said. If you don't sleep as well, you're more likely to be have metabolic issues. Um, so the mechanism for TV, again, it's not, it's not simple, right? You would think it would be couch potato, right? They're sitting there, they're more sedentary. In fact, they can't prove that children who spend more time with screens are necessarily more sedentary compared to kids who read or color with crayons, for example. What they think it is is the commercial messages and also the mindless eating while watching. And so what's really interesting about that is Childhood obesity rates, if you followed, have dropped off. The, the rate of growth has dropped off um, in just in the last few years. And some researchers think it's because of the handheld devices. They can't snack. <laughs> um, so an unlooked for benefit there. Um, but, the, but the junk food advertisers are still finding new ways. Like we, have, we thought we'd like tamed the commercial and that kids weren't watching commercials anymore, but now they have advertorial games and different ways of attracting kids. Um, with the, with the junk food. So, so sleep, obesity, but that's not what people think of when they think of screens. The things that people really worry about that keep people up at night um, have to do with people's brains, right? The children's brains, their social and emotional development, adults' brains as well, and also the interpersonal. So um, what's interesting in that whole area, um, 
is that for the most part, the effects are quite small across populations. So whether you're looking at attentional difficulties or whether you're looking at cognitive performance and school readiness, language delays, um, uh, anxiety, depression, they're pretty small effect sizes. Um, and one theorist that I followed um, who's very eminent in this field, she's from the Netherlands, her name is Patty Valkenberg, she advances a theory of differential susceptibility. And so what that means in simple terms, or she uses the metaphor of orchids and dandelions. So we can think of screen media exposure as being this incredibly broad environmental um, factor, right? I'm not gonna call it a toxin, but it's something that's around and almost everyone is getting it. Uh, most people are doing fine, right? Most people are, by definition, in the middle, they're doing okay. Um, they're like dandelions. Children, a lot of children are like dandelions. They're resilient to the media environment that they're in and they're doing just fine. And then there's a small percentage of kids, small percentage of people, who are more ses sensitive. And they are like orchids. They need careful care, careful attention. And there is a f seeming like, it's not causal, but it's a two-way feedback loop with these certain kinds of kids. So what I mean by two-way feedback loop, there's an interesting study, Jenny Rudesky is one of the great researchers right now in media interaction. Um, and the study is, uh, what's the interaction between kids' behavior and their media use? Well, children rated by their parents as being harder to calm at nine months old were watching 14 minutes more per day of television at two years old. Um, and so it's a really robust, it's a really complex interaction because you know the you know the doctor says what we don't quite know is maybe they are anxious babies who have anxious parents and their anxious parents are the kinds of parents that need more of a break so they gravitate towards media, or maybe they're fussier babies and they and media is one of the things that calms them down so the parents gravitate toward calming them down with more media, um, or maybe. Grad, you know, the kinds of families who tend to show kids more media um, end up with kids that are a little bit harder, you know, a little bit harder to, to handle or ha harder to self-regulate. But regardless of what, where the causal relationship goes, what we know is that there's this association. Um, and you see a similar association with children on the autism spectrum. Not causal, but um, for example, one study of two and a half year olds, the, uh, the typically developing group were, were watching about two hours a day of television. And the, the, the ones who had already been diagnosed as being on the autism spectrum were watching four hours a day of television. So it was a pretty big difference. Um, and, you know, the situation of kids on the spectrum is a really interesting one because it's a, it's a very complex relationship that they have with screen media. Um, you know, one school of thought is that, uh, you know, the way that, you know, one, one major uh, mode of therapy for kids on the spectrum is called applied behavior analysis. And essentially, it's a form of intensive conditioning of the children where you're constantly prompting them to give you eye contact and reply to your sentences and do certain things in order to get certain rewards. Um, and it's, it's like subjecting them to intensive interaction, interpersonal interaction all day long. And any time that they spend, in some, in some doctor's view, any time that these children spend plugged into a screen is time that they're missing out on this interconnection, this interaction that they are needing in order to, you know, change the, their behavior or their performance. Um, and that is the same hypothesis that we see with, with other doctors talking about typically developing children to say, um, you know, it's not that screens are necessarily harmful in and of themselves, they're not toxic, but it's that the screen time is displacing interaction time. And so we see language delays in children um, where there's a lot of television in the household because they're just getting less conversation from people. And hearing conversation from a television show is not the same thing as talking to someone in your house. Um, and maybe there's, there might be analogous emotional effects um, that you know, not having someone's attention, um, there's studies now of distract distracted parenting. So there was a small study with toddlers um, where the, the mother is trying to get the toddler to learn a new word and in some study conditions, she's interrupted in the middle of that teaching of the word with a phone call on a text, a text message on a phone. And that interruption, the, the children took like twice as long to learn the word. Um, 
And so, you know, it's like trying to replicate this condition of, you know, that we're all walking around with, where we're all like distracted all the time, and the kids are losing that social contingency that they might be getting um, otherwise. And so, whether you're on the spectrum or not, um, that's something to be, you know, interested in, curious about. Um, but there's this whole other thought of school of thought around kids, kids with the autism and screens, which is also interesting, which is that this is a thing that they love, and it can be a great accommodation for them. So there are apps that, that, you know, that nonverbal kids can use to communicate. Um, and there are simply like apps that help kids relax and chill out when they need to do that. And there are, you know, things where people feel like, well, if a kid has an interest, even it's a, it's a so-called restricted interest, you can build on that and you can help them, you know, express more or learn more um, based on that. So a really exciting example of that was the, the book, um, uh, by Ron Suskind about his son Owen um, that was about his son who had kind of regressed from the, from the age of two and a half and become nonverbal and was obsessed with Disney movies and he would watch them over and over again and the family would watch them together and with the help of a therapist they started entering into the world of the Disney movies with Owen and um, parroting the dialogue and talking the dialogue in the words of the characters and that was what helped him come out of his shell so to speak and learn to speak as well. Um, so that's an incredible example of screen time, right, and how it played this role in this family's life. And actually a really great example of a paradigm shift, I think, in how we should be thinking about screen time, um, which is that we know that there are incredible benefits to technology as well as risks and harms. And while many of the risks and harms seem to be arising from this solo use and this use that is dividing us from each other and interrupting us, Many of the benefits and the beautiful aspects of it are when media brings people together. Um, and that might sound kind of trite, but I have like very specific examples of what I'm talking about. Um, you know, obviously we use media uh, and families use media to connect along across huge distances. You know, we have a, we have a less than half of American families are living with two parents um, with, with children under 18. Most people have a parent somewhere else or someone else somewhere else. You got you know tons of families separated by deployment, by immigration, and so on a very basic level, electronic media can be a way of bringing families together, keeping families together, um, and I think that's overlooked quite a bit. In fact, there's starting to be one one uh, divorce lawyer that I interviewed told me that uh, electronic visitation is starting to be part of custody agreements and settlements in um, in family courts because. Uh, it's that important, and it's another method for people to be able to, to stay in touch. Okay, so connection, we know this, right? Um, the, the use of media for uh, intellectual exploration and discovery, um, you know, it can't be overstated. I think we, we oftentimes, it's very easy to look at how young children and children of all ages use it for entertainment, and we all use it for entertainment, and that's, there's nothing wrong with entertainment in and of itself. Um, but you know, I really am a follower of Seymour Papert, who was one of the foundational kind of minds in the world of educational tech. And he was, um, uh, he was an AI specialist and a mathematician uh, at MIT. And he was the creator of Logo, which is a programming language just for kids. And his sketches of computers for children became the prototype of the very first Dynabook, which was um, a prototype of the tablets and laptops of today. So the whole personal computing revolution kind of had its genesis, its origins, in Papert's ideas of how to make um, computing accessible to children. He actually studied, before he came to work with Marvin Minsky in, at MIT, he studied with Jean, Jean Piaget, the great de developmental psychologist. So he had this incredible background of computers and how computers can think and then also how children think and how we all learn to think. Um, and so Papert, you know, his work is the basis of things like mind, Lego Mindstorms and Scratch and a lot of the maker movement and the One Laptop Per Child um, nonprofit also had its genesis in his lab. So there's like a lot of offshoots into the world today of the cutting edge of what we think about when we think about children learning with technology. And his core insight was that children learn with technology by making with technology, that they need to be able to learn the language of computers, just like they learn Fran French by visiting France, that they should learn math by visiting the math land that is the computer. And um, he was a crusader for the first laptops in schools, and um, on one speech um, advocating them, he said, you know, people ask me why do I think children should have laptops, and my answer is because I have one. 
um, because they are actually a prime instrument for intellectual work of any kind. And if we don't think that the work of children is intellectual, then we have a really big problem. Um, so, you know, in this world that we're kind of like driven by fear and we're worried by sort of the lowest bottom of the brainstem purposes of this tech that we have in our fingertips, um, it can be a real challenge to turn it around and think, well, how could we share and enjoy ourselves the potential of technology to be a tool for learning? And, you know, this is a challenge for any parent, but I think like with anything that we want to expose our children to, we need to start with ourselves. We all use technology for good, for higher and lower or lesser purposes. <laughs> and it's a challenge as the, you know, someone who lives with people that they love or lives with children to try to shift it towards the higher purposes and to figure out how we're going to use technology with intention around our kids, how we're going to model the use of technology for discovery, for creation, um, as well as for connection. Um, and I, I offer a couple of examples of that. Um, one is, um, you know, simply kind of the, the discovery process, right? Screens on the side. So when your children have a question about something, you guys can use voice search together and you can discover really amazing answers to it. So the other day, um, for some reason, the word butte came up. And my daughter didn't know what a butte was, and I don't really know what a butte is. But we looked it up. We looked up, and then we looked up, you know, the national parks and the national park system and Teddy Roosevelt. And we're in this like one of those wonderful like cascading rabbit hole deep dives that come only when you have like a little bit of time and you know breakfast is ready. But um, we have this ability, right, to to use technology in that way, and it's really great when we share it. There's another example. There's um, a children's social network called Jam, which is all based on kids sharing instructional videos, and it's very moderated, it's a walled garden. A lot of the instructional videos are cooking videos. And so, ordinary afternoon activity, which is like baking cookies, now it has these like pre and post components, which are like research the recipe, watch someone else making it, then you know get figure out if you have the ingredients, then shoot the video, right, the steps of the video, and then you actually have the cookies and then you upload the video and then you look at you see if you have comments and there's like production. So it becomes this like very complicated thing, but it's also, it has so many other elements to it. And it's always, you know, there's times just to make cookies, but there's also times to engage in this kind of like content creation and community um, based stuff. And the nice thing about it is, you know, your kids are doing media because they, it's cool. There's things that they love about it and um, you have the opportunity to enter into it. And I think that parents don't get that permission enough. We kind of get the message that we're supposed to be limiting, we're supposed to be monitoring, um, but not necessarily having playtime alongside our kids. Um, so, uh, so I got into talking about the positive aspects of it, and um, I want to make sure that I'm, I'm talking a little bit too about social media, right? So what happens when our kids get a little bit older and what the phone represents, you know, they have their own phones and what the phone represents is escape into a peer world, a world of people who either are their peers or are pretending to be their peers and we're all kind of like terrified about what that means. And the challenges of parenting teenagers in this world um, are big, but they can't be, I mean, they shouldn't be overstated, right? Because a lot of the dilemmas are very similar to the dilemmas that our parents faced in, in, in that um, we don't know what they're doing, we don't know who they're talking to, we don't know where they are when we can't find them. Um, and parents have a fantasy maybe that they can, you know, we have a, a context of a lot of anxiety around teenagers and a lot around parenting in general. There, there is a very fraught world, it's a very anxious world out there. And um, we're gonna lose them, you know, to, to something if we don't do everything perfectly. And, um, you know, with social media, I think that there's, you know, there's inherent risks involved in being a teenager, um, a teenage girl or a teenage boy. And the, the nature of those risks has changed in a really interesting way because what we're finding in, with the generation of kids is that they don't leave the house as much. Um, so they don't crash their cars, they don't drink as much, they don't use as many drugs. Um, they're not as involved in violence, um, except in, you know, exceptionally under-resourced communities. Um, and some, you know, in some, not in all. But, uh, so in some physical ways, they're safer. And then there are these growing concerns that emotionally they may not be as safe. Um, that there, there's higher reports of um, depression, anxiety, narcissism, and we still don't know if that's a reporting thing. Um, and we certainly can't say that it's causal. 
but uh, you know, but but nevertheless, the feeling of a change is there. And what we do know is, you know, the nature of the of the dangers in social media, they're not as physical, but they can be um, the the interaction between the intense need that peer that teenagers have to have the you know to build their um, identities and to have the attention of peers and to have validation and they're you know and they're still not necessarily thinking through consequences all of those needs fit like a you know like a key into a lock with the mechanisms of social media the constant refreshing and everything's based on social approval and you know it's it's available all the time 24/7 um, and so uh, and so that's that's an that's an interaction that's giving a lot of people pause um, and uh, so at both ends, I think, of the, of the parenting spectrum with very tiny children and with teens, the worries are pretty similar in that we don't really know what it's doing to our brains. We don't have a lot of background to go on. Um, and, um, you know, beyond sort of what we as parents can do and how we can build that rapport and build that joint engagement um, and steer towards creativity and enjoy the, the, the fun of, of me media together, um, I think that there's another aspect to this as well, and that's a little bit of a call to action. So we're only 10 years into this era, and we've been very naive to the effects, and now people are starting to notice the effects. They're starting to notice you know, how they feel when they feel distracted all the time, when they feel like they can't put the thing down anymore, they can't have a conversation anymore. It's impinging on our lives in a way that we don't feel like we have complete control over. Um, and it may be, you know, changing the nature of civil discourse and what it means to, you know, read the news and do other things to participate in society. And, you know, other technologies have come into our world and we've had to have an immune system reaction. We've had to build it up as citizens, right? So, um, you know, cars came into the world, everybody loved them, cars were great, cars transformed the entire landscape, it was really fun, hot rodders. 1964, Ralph Nader came in and said, hey, guess what? These cars are designed to kill you. And the, the companies don't care. They're just building these cars with no safety and they have no, you, they don't even want to make safety devices on the cars because that would mean admitting that they know that they're dangerous, right? <laughs> Does that sound familiar? Um, and so they had this situation where they had to hold the industry to account with some pretty serious evidence to say, actually, you could be making it safer. And you know, the car industry turned around. They made up all these amazing safety devices. They made car driving a heck of a lot safer, safer after many decades of denying that they could ever do such a thing. Um, so, you know, that was a pretty important inflection point. 1980 was a pretty important inflection, inflection point. That was when um, a woman named Candace, uh, her daughter, Carrie, was killed, 13-year-old, killed by a drunk driver, a drunk driver who had been arrested already once for drunk driving and let go. And so she started Mothers Against Drunk Driving. And Mothers Against Drunk Driving was a little bit different from, um, you know, the unsafe at any speed era of Ralph Nader because they didn't just crusade for higher drinking ages and speed limits and differences in law, but they also had a very big campaign around designated drivers and friends don't let friends drive drunk. And so over the next 15 or so years, there was this concerted effort to get people thinking differently about how they use their cars and what it meant to drive and what was socially acceptable. Um, so that's another component that I think we're, you know, we're hanging out waiting for here. Where, like, how do we develop these social mores and social change around the smartphone and around mobile devices um, to change what's acceptable? Like we're seeing things now and people are arguing and divided about what's acceptable. Um, and so maybe there needs to be a conversation around that. So there's a regulatory conversation, there's a, but there's also a cultural conversation. Um, and, you know, part of the reason I wrote the book, I wrote the book to help parents with practical tools and information, and I, I mean, certainly have strategies I can share around different kinds of dilemmas that have come up. I've heard a ton at this point. Um, but also as a call to action to say that I think parents have a lot of um, moral valence and interest and ability to perhaps enter into this conversation about what does it mean to have ethical technology, what does it mean to have usable technology and, and technology, frankly, that's safe because we all love where it can take us. We all love, you know, where we can go with it. And we just want to be able to get there safely. Um, yeah, I'm going to call it there. Thanks. Most of what you talked about, I think, was the emotional aspects. Um, does any of the book go over how the light affects your eyes and just kind of that stuff, aside from 
not sleeping as well? Um, like the blue light and the, et cetera, all that, which is probably not the same as the TV light from before, because all those older people watched lots of TV. <laughs> Um, I mean, the blue light from TV can keep you up, and just regular lights overhead can keep you up. But the, the difference with the smartphone, the small device, is just that it's very close to your eyes, and the screen is shining right into your eyes, into your face. Um, so what else does it do? The jury's out. Like, myopia, nearsightedness, is up. It's up in a lot across the industrialized world. But less than saying that staring at the screen directly causes it, um, what they think is that they know, what they know is that being outside can prevent it. So it's kind of like, it's more of a displacement. So being outside looking at the horizon is kind of a key um, factor that keeps people's eyes safe when they're developing. I know this is a really broad question, but you have teenagers. Like, what are the most effective ways that you've found in kind of balancing out um, screen time and using it for good, not evil, and, you know, are there any things that you can really suggest that really help? Yeah, so, so um, after kids get to be late school age, uh, I mean, one, one researcher used a clinical term to describe this, so basically, like, they'll push back against any rules you make, and they'll try to get around them. And you're no longer in the realm of, like, making rules by fiat. So then it all becomes about family agreements and what is your family culture and, um, you know, sometimes you can use the carrot and the stick or you can have a contract. But uh, I think for me, like, a really fertile ground or a lever to press is to say, like, a lot of parents have changes that they would like to make. And teenagers actually appreciate it when, parent, when we're on the same page, we're all trying to make a change. And so whether that would be, you know, a screen-free family dinner or introducing times of balance, um, like that you get on that page too, and it's a change, a change we're all trying to make together. Because um, there are surveys that show that teenagers kind of do feel, like, even kids as young as 10, they do feel that um, they wish their parents weren't on their phone so much when they're trying to talk to them. So that's a feeling that we all kind of have. You kind of touched on this, but did you find any differences between sort of just like passive interaction versus like playing video games? in the research? Yeah, um, yes, there are differences, but the trouble is that the clinicians are divided on the meaning of their differences. So, for example, Dimitri Kostakis, who I mentioned before, kind of has a feeling that the interactivity of some good, you know, high quality apps and games makes them more like a toy and less kind of lulling in a bad way toward, is for young children. He kind of thinks that um, it's good to get those interactive apps. Um, but then Victoria Dunkley, who's a very anti-screens kind of psychiatrist, believes that the video games cause, you know, um, really dangerous kinds of stimulation for, especially she deals with extreme orchids, like extremely sensitive kids, and, and she would like va ban video games or allow like 15 minutes every other day of video games, and if you have to have screen time, it would be like a, a, a quiet show across the room. Um, but, and then, okay, and then when you look at the, the small numbers of, so people that have problematic relationships to media, and, and the term addiction is not in common use in the United States right now. It's not, it's not scientific. Um, uh, it's still in the process of being studied and debated, but the kids who are going, there are treatment facilities. There's summer camps, and there's out, out back, uh, wilderness programs and residential programs. Video games are the number one presenting condition um, for those. So, I mean, that, We've never had, we don't have people ad admitted into facilities for television addiction, which is interesting because we have a culture of crazy culture of binge watching, right? And in decades of, of television, we've never had this conversation about is television addictive? Like, what does it mean to have a television addiction? Are we all just functional television addicts? Like, I mean, that's what I thought when I looked at it, but you know, it's not, it's, it's like, does this interfere with your activities of daily life and have your relationships been pruned away and have you, you know, do, is there nothing else that you like to do? And if somebody was like that with television, we would just say, well, they're clinically depressed. Um, but that's, I mean, I don't know. I feel like we have weird cultural categories for these different kinds of things. I'm hearing, interested in hearing a little bit more about um, what you found with the um, the relation of screen time impact on sleep, and in particular, if you found anything, if the proximity to bedtime makes a difference. Yes, okay. thanks for mentioning that. Um, yes, about an hour before bedtime is when specialists like you to shut down the screens for kids. 
Yeah, that's what I would heard, but I just didn't know if there was, um, yeah, if there was a, a difference in turning off your screen, so four hours before bedtime as opposed to one hour before bedtime is. Well, so our bodies start to produce melatonin as soon as the sun goes down, and as long as we allow ourselves to have a more dimly lit environment, um, even from the time it gets dark, it's kind of like, if you're interested in promoting sleep, like go camping and be in a place with no lights, you know, at sunset. Right. Right. And then you'll feel your body will be tired. Like right. you're surprised how early you can get tired if there's no light coming in. So I would say, yeah, more, I mean, up to a point, more is better. Yeah. I mean, the question is what kind of daily routine do you have and yeah. can you accommodate it? Yeah, well, in, in Seattle in the wintertime, it's dark at four. So, you know, yeah, it, it makes a difference. There you go. Well, that's so right. And we have this cultural <laughs> expectation. You can't, we can't all be going to bed at 5 p.m. Right. Um, I think in, right, in some eras, it would like you be go to, you go to bed at 5 p.m. and you sleep for like six hours and then you wake up at three in the morning and light a candle and study and then go back to sleep again. But with kids, it's also important to realize that like any light in their bedrooms can be promoting of wakefulness. It's not just right. the, not just the screen time light. Thank you. So I should say I work at a school and we are definitely struggling right now with what you termed, talked about you know, what is acceptable behavior around using smartphones in school. So I wonder if you, in your research, if you have any thoughts or came across anything you can talk about, the intersection between what's acceptable behavior around phones at home versus when kids get to school where phones are becoming really a part of the daily routine. It's a great question and it's a very complex issue. Yeah. Um, yeah. So on the one hand, you have parents who decide that it's time for the kids to get their own devices because they're separated during the day and they want to be able to reach them. And there's different cultures from school to school. I mean, I've heard of schools where the kids are all in a group text at fifth grade, so they feel like they have to get the phone because they're left out of the, the deal if they don't have one. Um, and then at the same time, in some places, it's the school that's handing out devices and the parents don't know what to do. And some of them might be, they have certain rules at home, but then the kids are getting devices at school and they don't know how to bring them home or they'll like, you know, the kids, they'll, they'll take them home and they don't have the right security, pro, you know, um, protocols on them. And so kids are doing things they shouldn't be doing on the school issued computers. Um, so I, yeah, it seems like there's a dearth of communication between the two realms and figuring out, you know, are schools going to abide by the home rules or the, are the families going to abide by the school rules? And do, does everybody understand why they're getting the devices in the first place? I think there's been, there's been a real rush to adopt one-to-one -one programs across the country in advance of the evidence. You know, there's, there's small-scale evidence about different kinds of software applications, and, and there's also a general sense, I think, the, you know, the Papert sense, like the a good, good intentions to say, well, workplaces look like this, so classrooms should look like this. Um, and, I, you know, I, I understand, I'm totally sympathetic to that logic, but figuring out how to broker and how to balance between the two, I think, is, is still very hard. Okay. Yeah. Is that helpful? Yeah, it is. I, so I wonder if you if you have anything about sort of when is if, let, let's say about school age kid, is there a right age or a sort of a, a good age where we should set boundaries for kids in school about around using phones in school, and when is the right time to start letting go of the rules? So like, is it in primary? Is it in middle? Is it in high school? So when you think about the developmental sort of also the stage and so forth. Yeah, I mean, I think that, um, yeah, I think, I think, you know, beginning of middle school is when, um, you know, one-way dictates start to be less, less and less accepted. But the notion of having a contract or having expectations and having natural consequences isn't something that goes away. Like we have, if you're going to be part of the school community, you have to do certain things. Um, and so um, I think that, I think that would be entirely appropriate. I mean, you don't, you don't stop disciplining kids and making rules just because they don't necessarily react to them as well, but you have to do it in the sense of, you know, this is what our school does and this is what the expectations are and this is the purpose for it as well, right? Okay, thank you. Yeah. Is there any rough consensus about what are appropriate time limits for screen time at particular ages? Um, well, so, yeah, like the American Academy of Pediatrics will tell you like no more than 30 minutes for up to 18 months and no more than an hour for up to school age and then perhaps an hour to two hours a day later on they'll tell you that. But it's very different for different kids, you know. So really it's about like 
are you balancing it with other activities and things that children need to be doing every day? They need to be playing outside. They need to be eating without interruption. They need to be interacting with their friends. They need to be doing schoolwork and, and practicing mono attention and monotasking. Um, so, you know, is there enough time in the day actually to do all of those things is really more the point. That's a priorities question, not necessarily a time question. Where if you have the odd Saturday where they're, you know, binging all day long, it's not going to necessarily hurt them in the, in the broad scheme of things. Um, not just for kids, but for all of us. Um, just curious when you say... Uh, a call, you know, call to action. Yeah. What What does that look like? What are uh, designated drivers and airbags and seatbelts for this application? Yeah, great question. Um, I think that I know that parents want easier ways, and actually everyone. Everyone wants more transparency into what they're, they themselves are doing with their own devices, and they want easier to handle limits for themselves. Um, on their own devices. And they don't want things to be made in a way that's manipulated. Manipul 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 you don't want to feel manipulated, right, when you're, when you're using a device. You don't want to feel like, like they keep changing up the algorithm and it changes my whole day when it changes the algorithm because I have this habit. Um, and it's like low tar cigarettes. It's like, well, is this really making things safer for me or is it not? Or do they even care? Probably not. They make their money from your attention. So, you know, the... Um, uh, there's, a, there's a new campaign, the Center for Humane Technology, that uh, you guys might have seen. They had a big announcement in D.C. today, and it's a bunch of former Facebook, Google people, and they're kind of getting together to talk about how um, we know what persuasive technology is. There's tons of engineers and engineering work behind, you know, getting people to stay on, these, on our devices. And we would rather, it wasn't designed that way, and we would rather that we're not the product, but we'd rather be the customer. And... That might mean subscription-based services, for example, right? You pay the, you get behind the paywall, and then there's no ads, and there's no reason for there to be ads, and they're actually rating themselves on your experience, not on the amount of ads that they've served you. Um, so that would be one example. Another example would be, um, uh, uh, you know, like, wait, what did they do? So, oh, well, a simple one would be um, grayscale. So putting the phone into grayscale is an, is a, an example that's been used to just make it less enticing? And could you design a phone that actually had a quieter design to you and say, like, I never want to see a notification. Like, there's one kind of notification I ever want to see, and it's this one. And other than that, forget it. Any more questions? So you mentioned uh, Ralph Nader, and uh, I just remember like 10 years ago, he was remarking on the amount of time that we spend in front of screens and that that's not actually life, you know? And, um, you know, uh, I was curious, you know, I know that, you know, when you're growing up, when, when you're a small child, you need a certain types of activities, running around in nature, you know, and, uh, you know, interaction with friends and all that stuff in order to actually develop, you know. And um, then I've been looking at some of the research on how nature affects you, right? If you go out into nature for five minutes, it totally changes your whole disposition and everything. It's like meditating even, you know. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, if you're sitting in front of screens all the time, you don't get that. And uh, so, you know, you might have a tendency to be more depressed and, and stuff. So I wonder uh, how much studying they're doing on that. Well, yeah, I mean, that's um, all we have. We have correlations, and then we have, there's some kind of immediate studies. So the correlations, like large population surveys, right? And then there's like the immediate lab study, like, okay, you just use Facebook for 15 minutes. How do you feel? Um, and the interesting ones there are some, some key, some insights that they found. One is that, there's a relationship between how many people you follow on Instagram that you do not know personally and how crappy you feel after you use Instagram. Um, <laughs> and so the, the quote often erroneously attributed to Teddy Roosevelt is that comparison is the thief of joy. And so when we're using, the, t the extent that we're using social media to compare our lives to other people's lives that are not like us, um, it is promoting of certain, certain kinds of feelings that if you're introspective, you can probably recognize. 
Conversely, interestingly, um, there was a study that showed that uh, teenagers using Snapchat had much better moods than the ones who were using Instagram and Facebook. And the hypothesis there was that Snapchat being like an immediate chat function, it is not so posed, you're not performing something as much, you're actually just more like, it's more like you're having a conversation, it feels more spontaneous, and because it gets erased, there's this more of a feeling of safety too, it's not as sticky, which may or may not be true, but, but the, so it's not a given that social networks have to make you feel crappy by using them. Um, and, uh, and actually there's, a, there's been a couple of attempts, and one experimentally, to build social networks that are promoting of pro-social activity. So a social network that is based on getting you to be kind to a friend or to practice gratitude or send a note of encouragement to someone. And that's kind of like you're gamifying positive social interaction and you're gamifying getting people off their phones. Um, so there's, you know, with all the wisdom that the programmers have used to create the rules of these kinds of interactions, um, there are other ways of doing it as well. And, you know, I don't want to paint all of this with the same brush because the things we do on our phones are actually very, very complicated. And, and uh, for example, teens using social media is easily denigrated or dismissed or seen as promoting of all kinds of terrible things. But, you know, Social media is a lifeline for teens, like rural transgender teens who don't have an opportunity to connect with anyone else like them in their real face-to-face -face world, or even just people with crazy creative ideas and thoughts that they felt like they're the only one in their town. Well, nobody ever has to be the only one in their town any, or the only one in their school anymore um, if they luck into the right communities online. And, and, you know, I think it's important to recognize that. I think we can, we can say that tech is here to stay and that we can have better ways of using it. Well, if that's it, let's um, thank Anya for coming. Yeah.